Hey everybody, my name is Jack, or as I'm known around here, the Avid Assistant. Now if you follow the channel's community page, or if you've even just looked at the title, you'll know where I'm going with this. I'm going to use this video to talk a bit about how I got into the industry, and then how I ended up where I am today, and you know, so on and so forth. Just a, a bit about me. Now, normally I don't really like to talk about me, the channel's pretty much Avid tutorials, stuff on post-production workflows, stuff like that. Even on the Patreon page I'll talk about you know, my workflows and, you know, how I approach stuff, but I don't like to talk about me. But the reason why I'm going to make an exception in this case is because I keep getting um, Facebook messages, emails, um, YouTube comments, you know, all kinds of communication. And that's people asking me, how can I get into the industry? How can I work in post-production and editing of films? Um, and unfortunately, there isn't really a straight answer. There, there isn't a one path, you know, if you do this, you will get in or... You know, if you get this degree, or if you learn how to do this, or, you know, this, that, or the next thing. There is no one straight set industry recognized path. And by and large, I think that is a good thing. It allows people who think in different ways and come from different backgrounds to come into the industry in a way that works for them. You know, it's a, it's a pretty open industry, and in my experience, pretty blind to, you know, a country of origin or race or gender. You know, the creative industry, particularly of filmmaking and particularly of edi editing, I would say, um, is very, you know, sort of open to whoever you are, as long as you're keen on the job and you're interested. Almost everyone I've met, um, barring maybe one or two exceptions in 11 years, um, has been very, very keen to just get everybody on board. But we'll come back to that topic a little down the line. First, before I can tell you about how I got into the industry, I need to give you some background on <clears throat> where I was at the time. So, as you may have been able to tell, if you're familiar with this side of the world, I am indeed from Scotland. I hail from a town called Bells Hill in um, the central belt of Scotland, uh, not too far from Glasgow, the, the largest city. But in 2007, when I was 15, my family and I moved to Auckland, New Zealand, at the opposite end of the world. And it wasn't until I was over there that I started to lean more into the, the creative side of things. Up until then, I always dreamed of something sort of logical, building blocks based, like being an engineer. That, that was high on my list at the time. Now, once I was in New Zealand, I went to a couple of different schools before I settled, and I ended up settling in a school called the Corelli School of the Arts, uh, which was sort of a, an art school, not dissimilar to what you would see in like the movie Step Up, um, where we did all our normal schoolwork and normal subjects, but we also spent 30% of our time focused on an art form. At the time, I thought it would have been really cool to do acting, but I got in for dance, so I was a dancer for two years until I finished school. Yeah, I'm, I've been banging on for a few minutes now, and maybe at this point you'd start to wonder if I'm going to ever get to anything to do with film. But it was while I was at Corelli uh, that I met my girlfriend, now wife, um, who uh, decided to leave before the last year of high school um, to go to film school. Um, she decided she wanted to go to this university, this really great film course, and you know, it really intrigued her. And I basically followed her into that. I didn't want to stick around at high school if she wasn't going to be there. I didn't really know much about the whole film thing, but just followed her into it. And then it ended up just being a perfect fit for me. So we did a Bachelor of Screen Arts at the Unitech uh, Institute in Mount Arbor in West Auckland. And we did the film degree there from 2010 through to 2012. Um, I majored in editing, she majored in cinematography, and yeah, graduating in 2012, um, it, was, it was a big year, we actually had our first child then as well, and um, uh, yeah, it, it was around that time um, when I was graduating film school where I was properly looking for work and looking to how to get into the industry, and it's at that point where the, probably the most relevant portions for you guys um, uh, actually begins in this little uh, timeline of my career or whatever. So as we were graduating, we're coming out of university and we're thinking about the best ways to get into the industry. It's the end of 2012 and um, my approach to it uh, was to go onto this website in New Zealand called The Data Book. It's a, essentially a film listing of all of the uh, crew in film and television across New Zealand. And I basically just looked up all the editors since that's what I majored in. I was really into editing at this point. And... Um, you know, all the editors in my area that were cutting anything remotely interesting to me, um, I looked them all up on, on this website and just reached out to them. You know, if there was a phone number listed, I would call them. Um, otherwise, it would be an email. I think I reached out to probably about 35, 40 people um, around that period. A handful of them got back to me with some, you know, fairly generic but useful advice that I did use. 
Um, but there was one absolute legend of an editor called Eric DuBose. Um, and uh, he actually invited me around to his house for dinner, which was random and really, really cool. Um, and so I went around to his house and had dinner, and, you know, um, met his family and whatnot. And, um, you know, he sort of chatted to me about what aspirations and what it was that you're after and where you're trying to go and, and whatnot. Of course, you know, as an editor, he's not necessarily crewing um, any productions or would know of jobs going. But, it, you know, he's like, I'll remember you. And uh, if anything does come up, you know, that, that I could put you forward for, I'll let you know. And, you know, shook his hand, left the house, went away. And I honestly forgot about it because I didn't hear from him for a good long time. It was, it was about a year later, um, at which point I was working at a, a small post facility um, in Ponsonby um, in, you know, a part of Auckland um, that mostly did, you know, uh, commercials, the odd TV series, uh, smaller projects. It was run by two people. Um, you know, they, they did quite a lot considering the, the resources that they had. It was called uh, RPM Pictures. And um, uh, yeah, it was a great year working there, actually. Great great couple of guys, you know, met a whole bunch of really useful contacts while I was working there. You know, so working at post facilities, not even just, um, you know, I, I was an in-house assistant. So I was sort of doing basic assistant editing and, and basic assisting and technical stuff around the building. Um, but, but even just a, as a runner, um, in those kind of places can be really, really useful for meaning people. Um, so I suppose there's tip number one, um, you know, is, is just be somewhere where you get to meet people, you know, put yourself in that area. But yeah, I had, um, been there for, uh, about a year when Eric, um, called me, um, out of the blue and, um, he told me that he was doing this film, um, that it was, it was an indie film. It was quite low budget. And the sort of assistant editors that he would normally use, um, you know, w weren't available to do it or it was too, you know, low budget. It was like half the normal rate um, for an assistant. And so he asked, he's like, would you like to do it? And whatever you don't know about Avid or assisting that we need you to do in terms of the sync and prep and stuff, he said, like, I'll teach you on the job, um, you know, and then you'll have that skill and whatnot. And so, so I leapt to the chance. I was like, that's great. You know, let, you know, love to do it. And, um, and the best part about it was, is so because, you know, they're paying half rate and stuff, they're not expecting you to do heaps and heaps. So um, I was able to do that at night at the same time as doing my main gig. So I would leave work at about, you know, five, six o'clock and then head over to this other post facility uh, across town and work there until about 10 or 11 p.m., and I did that for like several months over the course of this film. And uh, it went really, really well. You know, Eric was very happy. Eric came together. Uh, yeah, it was after doing that job with Eric that he um, asked me if I wanted to do another one. Um, but this time it would be full time. I would have to commit to it because this was a network TV show. It was called uh, When We Go to War. Um, <clears throat> so this was for uh, TVNZ, I believe, did it. Um, might be wrong. Sorry if I'm wrong. I'm doing this off memory because I haven't had time to do a lot of research to prep for this one. And this was a, a really cool uh, drama set during World War One, and um, there was six episodes and each episode um, was from the perspective of someone else. But the, they all knew each other, they were, some of them were related, they were, it was part of this sort of uh, group of people whose paths would cross uh, during World War One. And um, it's great, it was one of my favourite stuff I've ever worked on, it's a really, really good story. Um, and a number of those actors from there I've seen, you know, um, in, in lots of New Zealand productions uh, since. And some of them left New Zealand going to on to the States and doing some really, really cool stuff there. Um, so, so anyway, um, <clears> there <throat> was another job with Eric that went really, really well. And I was developing a bit of a rapport with Eric at this point. I was getting a sense of, how, you know, all the way he liked things done, um, even stuff that we hadn't done before. I just sort of would know how he would like it done, you know, how he liked to keep notes, um, you know, the, to a certain type of effects that he would do, his approach to it and stuff like that. And so knowing, noticing those stuff of the editor uh, allows you to sort of anticipate their needs a bit better and then you can prepare for it and, you know, have stuff ready and waiting for them. Um, you know, and, and doing little things like that will help them remember you because you're the one that did that or, you know, oh, that was really nice. You know, any little piece outside of the, the core um, essential parts of your job 
will be remembered and appreciated, um, you know, and, and it always is. And then that's what will get them to ask you to come back again for the next job, um, which is what happened with me and Eric a whole bunch of times, actually, because after that, um, he uh, went to a company called SPP, South Pacific Pictures, and SPP sort of do a lot of uh, local drama in New Zealand. They make uh, New Zealand's uh, only soap opera, uh, Shotton Street, as well as making a whole bunch of commissioned dramas and comedies uh, in New Zealand that, that tend to do really well. Some of them even get sold overseas quite well. And um, uh, yeah, I sort of followed Eric there in assisted form for another several years. Um, I was an assistant editor there for about two and a half years across um, probably about five projects, you know, counting like a one season of a TV show as a project. And um, I also did, um, you know, uh, bits here and there helping out on other projects of like a week or two on one job or a week or two on that other show. Um, if you want to know more about any of these projects, by the way, they'll all be on my IMDb. You can look them up and get more details on them. I'm not going to give a full description of every uh, production. But what was great about SPP is because uh, because these were commission shows, they were of a bigger scale than what I'd done before. They had uh, more than one editor per show. You know, it, it would each show would be filmed in blocks, as is you know fairly common around the world. Um, so it was about two episodes per block, um, and it'd be a different editor per block, and also a different uh, director um, that would be rotating. And but there was one assistant. Um, and so I got to sort of handle everything and we didn't have a post supervisor either. So you sort of ended up, you know, just because there's no one else going to do it, it, you know, bringing in sharing a lot of that role, uh, with somebody in production. Um, so anything to do with post and scheduling and, you know, when editors need stuff or how long it's going to take them to do it, you could relay back to production and be a bit of a mediator there as well as doing the assistant role. Uh, but yeah, I got to meet a, a whole bunch of, uh, directors, a whole bunch of different editors um, and assist for them and a couple of them invited me on to other jobs which I, I did on those years as well um, really great editor um, called Margot Francis uh, invited me to this film called Abandoned with uh, you know Dominic Purcell and and uh, a number of other uh, great actors um, it was uh, based on a true story I think of um, of some sailors trapped on a, on a boat scene trying to get home and yeah it was just a it was just a really great time because again I had put myself in that position where um, I got to meet lots of people you know there's lots of different directors and, and network producers that were passing through the building all the time that I would get the opportunity to speak to you know um, you know wh whenever it was quiet or or even just about the production we were working on they would ask you know how's how's this going um, you would get to cut promos for episodes you know because you know it'd be like next week on you know whatever the show is um, you would get to cut those or the little recaps um, of the previous episodes. Sometimes you get to cut those and do like basic VFX comping work and stuff. And I think those two, two and a half years where I learned a lot of my core skills and sort of solidified them. Um, but there did become a point where uh, I had sort of gotten most of what I could get out of that gig. There, there, there wasn't really um, a clear pathway of how to get from assistant to editor, uh, which is kind of a, a big struggle that I've had, you know, throughout the years. Um, you know, it's something that uh, for the type of stuff I was after for scripted content and scripted dramas, you know, you had to have cut stuff before they would let you, you know, because the network had to sign off on it. You had to have cut something before they would give you the job. But I was like, I needed a job cutting something in order to have a real is that that catch twenty two, and it's been a it's been a bit of a struggle over the years, honestly, because I've been an assistant editor technically since um that first job with Eric, which would have been early, or which would have been in twenty thirteen, so quite a while, and then for the year before that, I was an assistant in the post house, so so there there was a few number of years that I'm not gonna lie, I had a chip on my shoulder about um having the word assistant in my in my title no don't get me wrong there i've met v many very 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 good career assistant editors um i'm not trying to put down the role um you know and it particularly like in, in wellington um in new zealand where you know peter jackson and james cameron are making a lot of cool stuff um <clears throat> there, there's a few really good career assistants um but uh, the, the difference of where i was and the sort of jobs i was doing is that the 
the pay rate at the time was quite low. Um, you know, and, and my wife um, wasn't working or couldn't be working at the time. And, uh, you know, and we had two kids, I think, by this point. Um, so I had to be earning more and editing and cutting was was where my passion lay. That's what I wanted to be doing. So so I did always have that goal in mind. That's where I was trying to get to at all times. And, um, you know, assistant editing was, um, you know, a way of me staying in the circle and staying around the kind of people that could get me there. You know, so I was still keeping with that same mentality, that same idea is that if I just stay around these guys long enough and I put it out there that this is what I want to do and I show them that I can do it, it'll happen eventually at some point. But I'm getting sidetracked here, as as I often do, you know, when I talk. Um, <clears throat> where were we? Ah, yes. Uh, two and a half years of SPP. After that, I believe I left in around uh, 2016, uh, 2017 to go and do Ash vs. Evil Dead. Um, which is a really fun, silly comedy horror series that's um, on Stars. Uh, well, it was on Stars when it was on. Um, I, I worked on the final season of it that everybody working on was hoping it wasn't going to be the final season. And, you know, they had amped up the ending as well. It had ended in a really great cliff- cliffhanger, but it wasn't to be. But that was a great experience for me. You know, that was sort of my first large-scale um, production. It was my first American production. I had, I had done films. I'd done over these years. I had done a few films, but they had been uh, New Zealand or Australian films, funded movies, which by no means were they necessarily smaller budget. But Ash vs Evil Dead had that big visual effects department, and it had a whole load of editors, and we had four assistants, and um, you know there was just the, the level of resources that went into it was on a whole different scale to anything I'd been before. And it was quite exciting. I was like, like this is where I want to be. That's that's the kind of level of work that I want to be doing. Um, and so, yeah, I, I want to target more, more of this, please, basically. I mean, not necessarily more of the shifts that I was doing. I think I was on the, the, the late shift, the late shift assistant. So I was on uh, starting at about 10 p.m. and finishing at about 8 a.m., um, and then sleeping through most of the day. So it was it was a bit of a blur all those months working on that job, but it was a really, really fun job. Great chance to, to practice a lot of offline visual effects work, doing a lot of paint work on eyes uh, for the, what do you call them, deadites? Their, um, their version of zombies, uh, deadites. Um, and, you know, uh, inserting mats of blood spurts and muzzle flashes and bullet hits and, you know, green screening and backgrounds and lots and lots of stuff like that. Um, so again, it was, you know, growing out my skill set in a really, really good way because it was something different. And that made me feel much more confident at that time to, you know, progress and, you know, to, to go after the larger jobs. Now that I had that one under my belt. Now, after Ash vs. Evil Dead, I had worked on a number of other projects around that time. There was one called uh, Chasing Great, um, which was a documentary about the New Zealand All Black captain, Richie McCaw that led the legendary All Backs through the two back-to-back Rugby World Championships. Absolute legend. I worked on a film called Beyond the Known World, which was really, really cool. And that was the one where I got to work with Jono. as Jono Woodford Robinson. He's a really, really great editor. He's quite active on the Avid Editors of Facebook page. Um, So shout out to Jono. Thank you for teaching me how to make a cup of tea properly. Um, You know, growing up in the UK, thought I knew how to do that. But no, you enlightened me to the world of Irish breakfast tea. So thank you, Jono, really. It's, it's been a life lesson that I've taken with me since then. You taught me a number of other cool little editing tricks. It wasn't just the tea, but the, but the tea was the highlight. So, you know, I just had to mention that first. But I, I got another taste of sort of American television with uh, this pilot episode of a show called Brickman Rodeo um, that never ended up getting picked up. Um, but what was really amazing about it was they came to New Zealand to shoot the pilot um, and uh, they brought out most of the American crew as well. Um, and it, it, it was about the world of sort of, um, you know, high school rodeo um, in uh, Colorado and America and um, in rural America. And um, the editor that came out to work on it was uh, Tersa Hackshaw. Um, and she, she was really amazing. Like, you know, her, her credits, um, you know, in the few years prior to that were a number of the Marvel Netflix shows, you know, like Daredevil and The Punisher and uh, Jessica Jones, you know, that, that those types of shows. 
Um, and she was really keen to chat about, you know, career and like, where are you going? And, and taught me a lot of really, really cool things and met my family and we chatted about kids and chatted about life and introduced me to a whole bunch of new foods, you know, and told me many times why New York is the greatest place in the world. Um, you know, it was, and it was just a really great three weeks, um, of, you know, working on this project, um, because I, I you know, after the three weeks of shooting, they, they took it back to the States for the rest of the post. Um, but it was really, really great. Plus, you're getting paid LA rates in New Zealand. So, you know, I was getting paid about triple what my normal rate was. It was insane. Um, but sadly, that um, show never got picked up. Um, so uh, I don't know where you are now, Tursa, but thank you uh, very much for, for that experience. It, it was really great working with you, um, you know, and, and chatting about all your projects. And something that I did with Tursa that I did with an, a number of other editors, but I think we had done it several times, where uh, was when she would go to assemble a scene. I would take the scene as well at the same time um, and we'd both assemble it um, do a cut and then I, I would pass it to her the the cut that I'd done um, and I would try to do it as best I could you know I'm doing it um, in between my other work you know I have to prioritize you know doing all the prep work and getting her everything she needs um, but then I'd try to do that as quick as possible still as good as possible but as quick as possible so I'd have time to cut the scene and then I'd pass it to her and she would watch it and she'd give me really, really good feedback and, and notes um, that I would then go and apply and do another revision of the scene. She'd tell me, how, you know, how it was better and um, and how I could improve. And, you know, I never forgot, like, all the notes that she told me. I remember particularly the scene where there's a, a character coming to the door of his love interest and he's there to apologize. And... Um, uh, you know, she kept telling me, like, not to cut away from him, you know, um, even even though the, the, the love interest character was giving a really great um, sort of emotional reaction to this apology and what he was saying, she's like, just hold on him, like, don't forgive him for, for what he's done, like, make him go through this awkward um, apology, make him go through this whole um, spiel that he has to do and make him feel it and make the audience see that he's having to go through that and then we'll, we'll have more empathy for him and and she was right you know the the, the scene works so much better after I'd, I'd applied her, her notes and, and then approached it from that point of view and thinking about you know uh, the feeling and what the characters were feeling not just about what I was feeling looking at them but thinking a lot about what the characters were feeling and you know which of those feelings I wanted the audience to empathize with and which I just wanted them to be aware of um, what did I want to lean into most what did I want to focus on and bearing that in mind and thinking about that as I was cutting it really did help me with with all part all aspects of it you know I approached the pacing and the coverage you know the sound design as well like everything you know just with that intent um, and it made for a much better edit in the end and well other editors had given me you know similar advice in the past when I had done practice assembling for them those sessions with Tursa were just really uh, really good and in, in-depth in um, you know and I never really forgot it so just thank you uh, very very much Tursa um, for um, those brilliant cutting lessons um, I have been trying to put them to good use ever since whenever I've got the chance so thanks again <laughs> but a little while after that it was towards the end of 2018 I remember I was I was doing some prep work for a few different commercials. I was driving, doing like a few days here, a few days there, around Auckland, um, you know, on, on different stuff. And I got a call from uh, this uh, production lady um, on this upcoming feature film um, and told me that the editor had uh, recommended me for it um, as a first assistant. And the editor in question was Mr. Luke Haig, um, who I had... Uh, worked with on a number of different commercials uh, mostly because he had uh, worked on a lot of commercials and then every year or two he would sort of take time out from that and do a film um, and then come back to commercials um, with it with that being sort of his mainstay you know that that was his approach to it which seemed to work really well for him and yeah he was going to do this at uh, this film called Guns Akimbo um, with uh, Daniel Radcliffe um, and you know it's this silly uh, action silly but really fun action comedy where you know, uh, um, Daniel's character, Miles, gets uh, guns um, bolted, literally bolted to his hands uh, as a punishment for sort of pissing off the wrong guys. And then he gets put into this gladiator style fight um, against um, this really psycho crazy girl, Nix. And then a whole bunch of chaos ensues. It was really crazy, fun film. Um, but what made this different from anything I'd previously worked on was that 
it was a uh, co-production between um, uh, New Zealand and Germany. And so I uh, was, you know, did, did the usual uh, assisting with uh, Luke. Um, we were based out of the, the studio, a place called Studio West in Auckland. Um, quite a nice studio, a bunch of really big projects been shot there. And, um, you know, we both provided our own avids, um, you know, to, to help out our rate a little bit. And, uh, you know, we, we did a lot of technical work ourselves that would normally go to a post house, including dailies and a lot of media management and some backup stuff. And um, as, as well as just the two of us, it was quite a sort of isolated in like the best way environment. It was just the two of us working and being brought rushes, um, you know, regularly. And then sculpting the film and putting it together and, you know, and because it was a big action set piece film and there was a lot of material, um, he would regularly throw me scenes when he was sort of overloaded or if there was too much for us to chew through and, and let me help. And so I would get to assemble bits and pieces and, and, uh, and sort of cut with them as opposed to just doing like a practice cut. I would get to assemble actual scenes and then um, pass it to him and then he would just do a quick pass and, you know, that would go into the assembly. Um, you know, depending on how good a job I'd done, you know, he might have to do a longer pass, but you know, um, I got to do, you know, assembling to a much, you know, higher level there with him. And, um, you know, there was a good amount of trust there and, you know, we'd hang out and it, it was a really, really cool project for me. Um, and I, I did the whole job as the assistant. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the edit got to a point where they were going to reorganize it. Um, and they decided to go in a different direction and both, myself and Luke came off the job and uh, you know they, they started looking for other editors um, and I didn't think much more of it until a little while later when um, they had found a, um, another editor in New Zealand and um, they asked me to come back in and do some assisting stuff and some prep stuff so I did that um, and then left the job again and then um, they decided that um, the rest of it was going to be done in the, at the German site in uh, Munich and at that point um, they asked me uh, if I wanted to come out to Munich um, to be the visual effects editor um, which was a role that I hadn't done before and um, I didn't really you know know exactly what that entails but um, the, I had gotten along really really well with uh, Tony Willis who was the uh, VFX producer and uh, yeah I had um, I was keen so I came out to Munich and, you know, he helped me out with coming to terms with the VFX terminology and how, you know, stuff was laid out and how it worked and how stuff was delivered and dealing with vendors and VFX turnovers and deliveries and all that kind of thing. Um, and we just had a really great time in Munich, you know, and it was, it was, you know, um, this just brilliant uh, group of people from a whole bunch of different countries. You know, we had people from, you know, France uh, and obviously Germany, um, a few from the UK, post producer Tony was from the UK. Um, we had people from uh, Czech Republic um, there. We had people from all over, like working in this one office at this one big table, um, you know, just all working together. It was it was amazing. It was so international. Um, obviously, that's before the utter calamity that is Brexit happened and, you know, sort of screwed that up for, you know, people like me to be able to do it. But yeah, it was a really cool experience and it was, the, you know, all of that visual effects, um, you know, um, experience and, and skills that I gained there um, that um, have allowed me to, you know, expand my skill set. And I've done the role of VFX editor a few times since then as well. Um, but before I finished on Guns Akimbo, um, they, they, they kept, it went through a whole bunch of different recuts, right? Um, and and changes and, and, you know, new directions for the edit. Um, and there was a several different scenes that they were having trouble with and these were periods of time where they didn't necessarily have an editor or they had just finished with the last editor and um, they would just let me do it. And so there was uh, three scenes throughout the film, um, you know, uh, not small, insignificant scenes either um, that I got to do some tweaking and recutting um, on um, to, to various uh, degrees. And uh, it was because of that that I got in, um, as well as um, VFX editor, I got an uh, additional editor credit um, for that one, which was really, really cool because, um, you know, there was, there was, I think, three or four editors credited as an additional editor on that one. 
and um, you know some of their other films that they're credited as editor on were like really big or, or films I had seen personally so it was really cool to just be credited alongside them in the same role and of course that was my first editing role you know that allowed me to um, go and look for editing work with having something there that I had cut that I could use as look I, I was an editor on this you know help let me cut something but little did I know I was just about to make this really difficult for myself because uh, during Guns Akimbo, uh, I kept flying home to Scotland um, like during weekends to visit and stuff like that because it was relatively close. And through a variety of personal reasons that I won't go into, we ended up, um, me and my family, um, moving to Scotland um, and like setting up the move then during that uh, sort of 2019, 2018, 2019 period. Um, and so I had came over um, straight after Guns Akimbo. I went straight from Guns Akimbo into Outlander. Another series for stars, but this time based in Scotland, in a town called uh, Cumbernauld. Mm. And uh, that was that was an interesting uh, difference experience. Um, probably one of my most stressful experiences. Um, as, you know, those who have met me there on that job could probably attest to. Uh, it was, you know, quite a difficult time, I think. Um, really, really great, and I met some awesome, awesome people. And uh, I really enjoyed the show as well. Like actually before I hadn't seen any of it. And then while I was in Munich and I was finishing up on a Kimbo and I knew I was going on to this, I actually burned through four seasons of Outlander just to get ready for. It was the fifth season I was going on to work on. And uh, uh, yeah, so and so yeah, I sort of knew all of it going in. I'd seen everything. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I sort of jumped right into the role. Um, you know, I had like, two days to, to find and buy a car when I first got to Scotland as well because Cumbernauld is not a very accessible town um, but uh, yeah got there, uh, did the job I think uh, I was on it for about I don't know uh, maybe five months or so um, it was it was really, it was a good job you know and you know big production again and it proved to be incredibly important because moving to Scotland I didn't have the the network, the network of people um, there that I had built up in New Zealand over years uh, that I could call upon when I needed work or needed a job. Um, this was my first first you know foray into that in Scotland, and so um, it was really crucial for me to sort of network there and meet some people. And I did tried very hard to stay in touch with since um, you know, and, they, and they've been very kind to me. Um, so thank you guys. Uh, you know who you are. There's a number of you. So not going to name everybody, um, but uh, uh, yeah, I didn't actually manage to stay on that uh, until the end of the season because um, a very, very close friend of mine back in New Zealand, uh, you know, got in touch and said, hey, um, uh, we're, we're getting married, you know, um, you know, I was close friends with, um, you know, him and his partner, and they're like, hey, we're getting married, um, we'd love for you to be the best man at the wedding, um, you know, could you come back for that? And uh, so I left uh, Outlander in, uh, I think, October to go back for the wedding. And that was really cool. Obviously, I was very happy to go back, see my best friend at the time and and see, and, you know, be at his wedding and have some really great memories there. Um, but it was, it was during that time that um, uh, I got uh, contacted about a film that Luke Haig from Guns Akimbo um, that I knew very well had been asked to cut. But it turned out that this was a really low budget film and it was going to entail probably a number of months you know hard work and to to bring the edit together um you know this full-time job you're cutting a feature film it was an action um you know drama film um set in um south of new zealand um you know post uh, uh post-apocalypse type world um you know but an intimate character story and uh uh, so because Luke w wasn't going to be available to do that, um, not for that rate anyway, he's, he put me forward for it. And um, after some discussions with the, um, the writer directors, um, you know, both Justin and Aaron, I, um, you know, agreed to um, cut the film and uh, we got to work on it. Um, and it was really, really cool. It was um, I had suddenly gone from. Um, only having cut um, some short films and um, some web series content stuff um, and my little stint on Guns Akimbo to now cutting a feature film, you know, like something that had, um, you know, like some, some well-known New Zealand actors um, 
or lead actor actually I think Josh he he went to the states to head it, to be the lead in um, an American show over there I'm not sure where it was but if uh, if I find it during the edit I'll put it on the screen somewhere now um, but uh, yeah it was a really really great film and some really terrific performances um, and it was and I, I would say the thing that I learned most about that and probably for any um, you know, um, looking to be editor um, of a film, scripted film and TV, um, a, a big thing to learn is, um, you know, the the balance and the relationship with your with your director and with your producer and working that out um, because uh, you know they were they were um, down south in uh, the South Island. When I was working with them and it was right sort of at the start when COVID was starting to happen. So shortly after that, you know, restrictions were introduced um, and we we're still working on the film. And so we did the entire film remotely. I never once met them, um, which was quite tricky because you're trying to find, build this relationship with your directors so that they trust you to make decisions with their film, you know, with their script, you know, as a writer director team. Um, you know, and to, you know, they trust you to you know, follow your own ideas, to make suggestions, um, to have a bit of a back and forth. You know, I think that the best director editor pairings, um, are quite sort of intimate and, cl and close because they can no filter talk to each other, um, about ideas. You know, both the, the editor could suggest any idea in terms of, uh, restructuring and timing of the film. And the director can to the editor, and they can both be bluntly, perfectly honest about how they feel um, about that idea, whether they think it'll work or not, or not at all, or um, or they try it, or if they watch down one of those ideas and they're like, "Nah, I don't think it works at all," or you know, that's that's great, I really love that, but what if we did this and also did that and added to it, and then we took it in this direction? Um, you know, you need to build that sort of rapport and that relationship, and um, that was something that um was uh, just a big learning curve for me it didn't come necessarily right away um and but i do think that the edit that we had arrived at at the end and the relationship we got to by the end was one that benefited the film and got us over the line and there was a lot of respect earned um on that film um on both sides and um that that was uh, you know a really key essential um skill for me to learn um going forward that sort of interpersonal dynamic um and on a tricky one as well it's quite sort of being thrown in the deep end socially because as i say we're all remote i never once met them so thank you aaron and justin for the opportunity and, and the film and um i'm gutted that i left new zealand before i got the chance to see it in theaters um but you know i have a bunch of friends back there who did go and see it um you know and all my family went to see it and you know, and, and they really loved it and they enjoyed it. So if you ever get the chance, go and see Norseburg, guys. Solid New Zealand independent film. Um, and, you know, that, that was my, my first proper um, editing gig as, as the lead editor on a project. Now, if you're keeping up with the timeline, we're now at about early 2020. Um, and um, obviously I had a put off going back to Scotland to do this job um, so I could do it with them. And as well, um, I also um, had to take on another job because uh, Noshbar, as I said, it was it was quite a low rate. It was a very low flat fee for doing the whole film because they were trying to stretch their budget, you know, as far as they could go. Um, you know, I think they had about one hundred and fifty thousand, maybe New Zealand dollars, um, and they were it was quite an ambitious project. Um, so they had to stretch that as far as I could. So um, I did a film. I jumped on as an as a, a second VFX editor on a project called Shadow in the Cloud, which was this really awesome um, action uh, sci-fi you know romp um, set during World War Two with uh, Chloe Grace Mortiz. She's playing this pilot who sneaks on board this uh, flight um, leaving from New Zealand, and um, you know um, the, she's she's carrying some precious cargo so to speak without without spoiling anything and she's she's just there to protect that and it's a bit of a mystery and um then while they're in the air the 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 ship gets attacked by um you know something a bit supernatural um you know and um <coughs> and uh, i don't don't want to spoil it for anyone because it is quite a fun fun film but um on that project i got to work with you know some really really amazing people at every turn and every department you know i am um, Anu Webster, who was the lead VFX editor on it, 
is amazing and taught me a lot of the tips and tricks that I know about Avid um, that I've used on the channel and whatnot and in subsequent jobs. Thank you, Anu. I had met him before on, on, on Cross Pass. He was also on Ash vs. Evil Dead and I had met him at SPP once back in the day. Um, but that was sort of my first time working more closely with him. You know, I'd come on to the project to sort of help out him for a bit and then he was leaving because, you know, the project had run over, I think, and, and he had another job booked. And so he was showing me everything he'd done and I would take over um, with the same workflow he had set up thus far. Um, and so, yeah, first of all, working with Anu was amazing and learning from him. Um, then uh, the editor, because um, it was still in the edit while I was working on it, so I was doing a lot of assistant tasks as well as VFX editing. Uh, the editor was uh, Tom Eagles, who's amazing. I had actually assisted for him years prior um, at SPP on one season of West Side, I think Series 3. Um, and, uh, you know, I learned a lot from Tom. You know, he's particularly the way he um, approaches scenes in terms of music. Um, you know, he, he has a lot of ideas. I think he's very musical based. You know, he, he, um, he's got a lot of ideas about structuring a scene and, and, and the musicality of it. And, and he likes to get the composer involved as early as he can and have the music and the edit inform each other. And, um, you know, he had, he had, before we did Shadow, um, he, he had worked on um, a film with Taika Waititi called um, Jojo Rabbit. And um, well, towards the end of Shadow, he actually had to um, go because cause he had been nominated for the Ace Eddie Award for Jojo Rabbit, which he won, by the way. And, and, and he'd also been nominated for uh, the Oscar um, for Best Film Editing for uh, Jojo Rabbit as well. Now, he didn't win that one as well, although it was nominated and, we, you know, we gave him a big... Um, and we were all watching at the time in New Zealand and, you know, I sent him a bottle of whiskey. Um, that's how I like to celebrate. No, it was actually um, Ford versus Ferrari that won, which was Andrew Buckland and um, Michael McCusker um, that cut that one, which is a brilliant film. Um, much better title in America than it is over here. Um, in the UK, it's just called Le Mans 66. Um, but I think that's due to a rule in the UK about having um, uh, brand names in a film, like, like Ford and Ferrari. Um, so they had to change the name. But yeah, really cool film. And it is actually edited beautifully. It's it's a fantastic, fantastic film. Um, so you, you, couldn't be, you couldn't be too disappointed about it. Um, but uh, yeah, it was... Um, Tom Eagles is a really, really cool um, editor. Uh, and and he's, he's rightly um, gone on to do some really cool things. Including Netflix's uh, "The Harder They Fall" with Idris Elba, um, he's taught me a few, a good few editing technical editing tips, um, like like uh, approaching it with the music and the feel. Um, you know, I also learned a bunch of um, avid stuff um, from Tom as well um, from his time because um, he also did uh, VFX editing back in the day before before getting into cutting. Um, but um, as well as Anu and Tom. Um, and uh, I also got to work with Weta because they were doing the visual effects of the film and I was VFX editing, corresponding with them a lot. So that was an amazing experience. I got to work with um, the director, uh, Roseanne, um, a lot um, uh, doing visual effects reviews. So she'd sit in the room, I would run the Avid and we'd review the VFX shots as they came in. Um, and that was awesome because... I got to chat with her a lot about, you know, film and, and sort of life. You know, she'd tell me about life in, you know, in Hong Kong and, and where she was from and, and talk about New Zealand. We'd talk about the film industry. And she's a wonderful filmmaker. She's made some really, really cool stuff. Um, fun fact is actually um, the first um, time I ever heard of Eric DuBose, the first editor we spoke about, was um, a film that he cut that was shot at my uni while I was at uni called My Wedding and Other Secrets, which Roseanne um, directed. And it was actually based on um, Roseanne's own experiences um, uh, and, and her early life. Um, so that was really cool. And I just felt like it came full circle. And I told her that when I got to meet her and she thought it was quite cool. It was her first film project, that one. Um, but this was quite a different film, Shadow. And, um, you know, it, it was... It was really, really cool because, um, you know, she would um, talk with me at the Avid um, about, you know, film and structure and, and how she got into the industry and, and, you know, suggesting things of where to go and, and projects to, to you know, uh, consider going for in terms of editing. 
um, to get to where I wanted to be. And um, I'd, I'll always be really thankful to Roseanne for that. And she actually um, put me in the direction of one um, after that where um, she put me in touch with a friend of hers called uh, Michelle, uh, Michelle Ang, um, who I had seen on screen um, in, sev- in New Zealand projects um, from back in the day. Um, but uh, she had gone to the States and done a whole bunch of acting work and some really cool acting work um, in shows like uh, Fear the Walking Dead, for example. Um, and she um, is currently actually voicing one of the characters in Star Wars The Bad Batch as well, which I think is really awesome because I'm, I'm a big fan of Dave Filoni's Star Wars work um, and and where he's gone with that. So, uh, you know, I'd, I've totally nerded out with her about that. I think that's awesome. But anyway, sorry, getting sidetracked again. Uh, Razan had put me in touch with her because she was um, uh, trying to edit a short film that she had made, this really great um, drama short film about motherhood um, and the trials and tribulations of of motherhood and trying to get an intimate, close um, perspective um, of that and, and through the eyes of, of this um, single mother. And, um, and, and she had played the lead role and she had written it and directed it and it was a beautiful, beautiful film. It was called uh, Nye. And um, uh, yeah, um, I, you know, Roseanne put us in touch and, and I had chatted with her and we had worked through the edit together and got it over the line. And it was a really, really great short film to work on. Um, and it done some festivals and done some things. And um, uh, yeah, and but more, much more important from, than that film for me was that relationship with Michelle um, and getting to meet her and getting again to work with a director and build a repertoire and, um, you know, uh, build a, a good working relationship and, and practice that sort of social skill again of, of working with your director and um, it went really, really well and we've kept in touch since and um, I'm actually going to cut another project with her soon, so excited. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, you know, you're start, starting to see the, you know, the, the connections that you make um, as you do jobs and if, 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 you, if you do them well and, and people do remember you and they'll invite you back on jobs and, and they'll also introduce you to other people that they know. And so the network of people that you know um, all of those people, their networks can become yours if the people you meet end up liking you and, and then they end up appreciating the work that you've done. Um, so you can piggyback off of their extended um, network of film crew and film people in order to help you climb the ladder. Now, I won't leave it quite there. Um, I'll also mention that uh, after Nye and after uh, Shadow, I did come back to Scotland. Um, this was peak pandemic. This was August 2020. Um, I um, flew across the world back to Scotland, which was an interesting flight. Um, you know, you're talking, um, it, you know, because we had to wear masks the entire time. Um, we couldn't move around the airport in Singapore and it was an 18 hour stopover. So we we're just put in this area and it was like, just wait here for 18 hours until your next flight. Um, and, you know, you're just sort of sitting down. You couldn't go anywhere. And then there's... And the flights themselves are like 12, 13 hours each. Um, yeah, so was, that, was a, that was a fun trip. Um, but when I came back, the first job that I jumped into in 2020 was an animated feature film. And I'd never done animation, and it is very, very different to live action. There was a good number of cross skills that I brought over from doing VFX editing work, since the VFX and the animation workflows have a lot in common. They're not the same, but there is overlap, and they do have a lot in common. And... Um, uh, but yeah, there, there's an animation company based in Glasgow called uh, Axis Animation, and they were making this feature film called uh, um, Scrooge. It's a Netflix original. It was a Christmas movie that came out um, just this past year in 2022. And I was on that for two years. Um, it was my longest project I'd ever done. A great, great group of people. Um, I've met some really good friends since. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was a brilliant project. Um, and, um, I got to design a lot of workflows. Uh, they were making this feature film called, uh, um, Scrooge. It's a Netflix original. It was a Christmas movie that came out, um, just this past year in 2022. And I was on that for two years. Um, it was my longest project I'd ever done. A great, great group of people. Um, I've met some really good friends since, and yeah, even though I hadn't done animation before specifically, there was uh, overlap with visual effects and some of the other stuff I'd done. So I was able to 
use those skills and bring bring those skills and workflows in, into this project you know uh for example you know stuff like doing avid transcodes in resolve is, is a more efficient way of ingesting uh the workflow that i use for creating visual effects ids and hiding it in the subcap and coloring them i was able to use that for uh sequence slugs and burn-ins that we were able to color code and you know use to mark statuses uh, speaking of statuses, I used Avid's uh, custom property um, timecode generator uh, in order to denote uh, quickly um, statuses of shots and where they were in the animation process, um, you know, more efficiently than in other NLEs. Um, I created a spreadsheet for tracking, for edit tracking that I had previously used in other um, post facilities. It was like a, meth a layout that they had used in post facilities that had worked at um, RPM that I spoke of and uh, images and sound. Um, so that was really useful that I was able to incorporate that as well and use that. And I also made sure that I was fully up to date on the very latest versions of Avid Media Composer before we started so that I'd be able to advise our awesome, you know, lead editor, Graham and the other assistants and stuff and show off like the latest features that we might be able to utilize in this project. You know, I always like to be on the, the latest, latest versions of Avid at home so that I can then bring them into whatever facility or wherever I'm working and sort of suggest them and say, hey, can we utilize this? Is there a way we can use this to help make things faster? Um, and, and we did, we used uh, stuff like Avid's uh, bulk edit feature and the find and replace in the bins, which is really, really useful for, you know, when you're dealing with lots and lots of clips or slugs or something like that, wherever you need to batch rename something um, and, and organize stuff in a tidy fashion, and you're dealing with a lot of clips and metadata. Um, you know, I think it's actually one of my favorite new features that Avid's added in the last few years in the new UI. Um, so thanks again, Avid. Always appreciate that one. Yeah, um, I did that for a couple of years, and um, and since then, um, since finishing that um, at the beginning of twenty twenty two, I've done um, a few. I've done a couple of uh, short films with a company in the northeast of Scotland called Page Break Productions. Another really good working relationship. Um, I'm hoping to work with them again for the third time this year on a larger project. Um, I've uh, you know, I assisted on a comedy series called Two Doors Down, a BBC comedy, um, where I got to go down to London for a good while and work there. That was fun. I was actually in London working on that show while I was doing the recording the E100 course. Uh, I think you can see me talk about or, and see in the background that I'm in a hotel room. That's where I, that's why and that's what I was working on. And yeah, um, and I'm currently, um, you know, uh, working on um, some other really cool projects that at the moment until it's released, until it's out there in the world, I can't talk about or tell you about. But um, yeah, it's slowly building up that network of people here in the UK that I had in New Zealand. And even after, you know, 11 or so years, it's it can still be a bit of a pinch and a bit of a struggle, especially if you're in a different city different country you know vying for that work um it can be a bit tricky um but you know i still do have my network in new zealand and i do the odd job remotely for there as well and might even be going back there for a job this year as well so who knows um might be heading back for for a few months to to do a gig there we'll see um uh, but that is us sort of caught up you know um to where we are today that's my story but looking back on the story that i've just told um and trying to answer the question that I've been sent several times of how to get into the industry, um, you know, I could pick out maybe some key things that I did that helped me um, that you could maybe try um, that, that might work for you. And that would be uh, try and find people who are doing what you want to do and get in touch with them, reach out to them, um, chat to them about, you know, your passion for it, how you would like to also do that, where you'd like to go with that. Most people, and I mean most, like 99% of people that I've met in this industry are really keen to help people um, wherever they can. And plus, you'd be amazed at how much you get just by asking. Because most people don't ask. If you just uh, ring up, um, you know, try and get actual contact with them and then ask how, you know, could I assist for you on your next project? Could I... You know, work in your post facility and uh, yeah, and then see what they say. The, the worst thing you can do is say no and then, you know, you haven't lost anything. So why not? Um, and the second one would be the one that um, came up a few times and that would be um, try and put yourself in those situations where you are around those people. So whether that is being a runner, a post facility or, you know, a, a basic, you know, trainee, a helping hand or free work or whatever it is at the start. Put yourself around the vicinity of those people that you want to work beside, that you want to work alongside and, um, 
you know, or, or that would employ you to do the job that you want to do. And then you'll have the opportunity to talk to them. They'll remember your face. Um, you can chat about your ambitions to them whenever you can. And that will help you. And they will remember you. Um, you know, like I said, most people want to help wherever they can. Most people, that is, they're like, their instinctive reaction is to help, uh, at least in my experience anyway. So if you can just put that out into the world that that's where you want to go and that's the direction you want to go in, then, you know, you know, people will notice that and they'll do what they can. And third and lastly, I think this is just common sense, but I'll say it anyway, is I just say try your best to do the best you can on every job you get. It, it, treat every job, even if um, it's a gig that you feel like you've done a million times before, even if it's not necessarily what you want to be doing right now, treat it just like what it is. Treat it for the blessing that it is, that, um, that you're in this industry and that you're doing it and and um, and try and get as much as you can out of that um, and do the very best job you can because then that's the way that you'll be remembered and noticed by people and brought on to other more exciting stuff. You know, um, I feel like I've done okay in that regard. There, there are one or two jobs where I've admit I've maybe been in a bad place or struggle with some stuff at the time and um, I've honestly one or two points in my career, one particularly where um, the job didn't necessarily go that great for me and I was panicking about, you know, have I ruined my career by making a bad reputation here, have I totally screwed myself, is that me blacklisted, whatever, and I freaked out about it and I let it get me down for about a year after that. Um, and if that happens to you, don't don't let it, you know, you can pick yourself back up from anything and carry on um, and uh, just try and do your best you can on the next one. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing that can't be fixed. Um, so, um, don't let, don't let it get, get you down the way I did because I think I waste a lot of time and energy worrying and stressing about that. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, just try and do the very best you can. People do notice and they will notice, um, the very best editors that I work for, not necessarily the best, editors i mean i mean just uh, just the best relationships i've had like luke haig and eric um tersa um you know i know i'm gonna miss people out and there's a chance they're gonna see this and then i'm gonna get in trouble um i'll be getting text messages after they see it um but uh, these people that um tony from guns akimbo uh, michelle are like really prized you know th those relationships are really utterly priceless um and wouldn't change them for anything that lasting sort of um positive um uh impression that i have with them that they remember is is utterly invaluable both to my career and to and to life you know because it invites me to do more stuff with amazing people it invites me to come back and work with them again and these are people that i would work with and most of these people i would work with again in a heartbeat for free really you know and I've told them that, you know, and they, and they know that um, I love hanging out with them. And, you know, I guess that could be a fourth one. Try and find people that you enjoy spending time with. Editing is an intimate, um, you know, endeavor. You know, it's not like being on set where there's lots of people and there's that sort of camaraderie um, that you all share. We don't get that, you know, when it comes to the rap parties where they're celebrating finishing, we're just getting started and you go to those rap parties and unless your editor comes, you might not know anyone there. It can be a bit tricky because for us, it's an intimate experience. It's the editor and the assistant or the editor and the other editor. Even on larger productions, it can be a small, intimate feeling department. So when you uh, get the chance to work with people that you enjoy spending time with day in, day out, and you enjoy working with, um, you know, uh, make the most of that and treasure that and s stay with that as much as you can. Um, I guess you could take that as a fourth one. But uh, yeah, um, I hope that sort of answers the question. Um, I think my, my wife would affirm that, you know, I'm more like the Chandler from Friends. I'm not supposed to give advice. I'm not the best person at giving advice. Um, I can tell you technical stuff all day long and I can give you my opinions on things, but I'm not necessarily the best at the advice thing. Um, but I do hope that by just telling you my experiences and my very subjective um, experiences and, and, you know, where, I've, where I'm coming from, that you can use that in some way um, to, um, you know, help, help you get on that ladder and get you to where you want to go. So yeah, he here's to you guys and here's to your career. And um, I hope I get to cross paths and work with some of you at some point in the future. I've already chatted to a whole lot of you 
over email and um, Patreon and all, all these other platforms connected with this Avid Assistant community. So thank you for that. And um, yeah, here's here's to all of you. Slanjivar. <laughs>